Thanks for tuning in and welcome back to the shop. If you're new here, this is our 2013 Mitsubishi Fuso FG and we're turning it into an overland camper. Over the past couple of months, I've been working on the interior and now it's time to focus on the electrical system. In the last couple of episodes, I built a lithium iron phosphate battery pack, I wired up the balancers, and I've installed the BMSs. And you may notice that this looks a little different from where I left you at the end of the last video. I started test fitting things and I just couldn't stop. All I have done is connect the battery terminal of the BMS to the negative of the battery, connected the output of the BMS to the bus bar. I've brought the balance leads up to the top between the bus bar and the BMS, and I've also run the wiring for the Bluetooth connection. And that means at this point, the BMS wiring is complete. Now it's time to get onto the rest of the system. <laughs> to complete the wiring on the negative side, we need to run all three outputs to one shunt, and then from the shunt to the bus bar. With the potential for 150 amps coming out of each battery, we need to have a pretty heavy duty cable. But how do you know how big the cable needs to be? Well, the manufacturer supplied wiring is four gauge. And we know that because it says four AWG on the side. But that doesn't necessarily mean that four gauge is correct for everything that we're gonna be doing. So I use an app called Wiresizer. It's pretty straightforward to use and you can download it in the app store, no affiliation. And as I said in the previous video, I like to oversize things. So I'll be going with two gauge. In the last video, when I was crimping the small wires, I showed you the type of ratcheting crimper that I use that I highly recommend you use. If you have a set of crimpers that looks something like this, don't use these. Obviously, those are for smaller gauge wiring, but we have a similar situation when it comes to the larger gauge wiring. This style of crimper can do the job on maybe 8 or 10 gauge lugs, but I wouldn't go much larger than that. When you get up to the really heavy gauge lugs, you have basically three options. Some people think it's okay to use these. You gotta be kidding me. Don't use these. You may see an option out there for a tool that allows you to use one of these. Okay, but... Don't use these. When you get up into the larger gauges of wiring, these lugs can cost two to five dollars a piece. You don't want to be using a tool that's going to wreck your lugs. So what are you saying? I highly recommend you use this style of crimper. This is a hydraulic crimper and it allows you to choose the correct size die for the wire you're crimping. They do the job properly and honestly on a job like this, you'll spend more money on lugs than you will on that tool. I don't know if you've been able to tell, but looking around my shop, it should be pretty obvious I have trouble throwing things away. But luckily for me, that means I've been able to scavenge some old wiring. So all I need to do at this point is cut it to the right length and recrimp new ends on it. If you're going to be taking on a job like this with some heavy cable, I highly recommend getting a pair of good cable cutters. These will last you just like a good set of crimpers. Spending money on tools and learning how to do the job will always get you farther ahead. This little negative cable happens to be exactly the right size if I cut it in three to run from the BMS output bus bar to the shunt. With two quick, simple snips, this old cable turns into three and fits the bill perfectly. So easy when you have the right tool. I like to use a knife to trim the ends of the jacket off, but you need to be extremely careful not to cut into the wire strands or your fingers. Next, slip on the lug, being very careful that no strands stay on the outside and it should stop just before it contacts the jacket. Then, with a final push, we can ensure that it's nice and tight and the wire strands are pushed all the way up into the nose. Next, insert it into the crimper with the correct die installed and simply pump the handle until the two halves of the die meet to make a perfect crimp every single time. It really is that easy. And every time you crimp, give it a good pull test to make sure it's tight. It's such a simple tool to use and it really does the job properly. So if you're doing a project like this, seriously, take a look at the link in the video description and get yourself the right tool for the job. Lastly, we want to finish things off by applying some good quality heat shrink. When you're doing a project like this, make sure you buy the heat shrink that has a sealant in it. This will prevent moisture and oxygen from getting to the connections and corroding inside your terminals. You know it's sealed when you see it coming out. Now that I have three identical cables, I can loosely attach them to the shunt and then we can start placing the shunt based on the wiring. To get the final placement of the shunt, I'll connect all the wires loosely. This may not be as pretty and perfect as straight lines and nice round corners, but this three-armed octopus is functional regardless of the aesthetics. 
Oh, and if you're looking for these nice stainless button head quarter 20 bolts, there's a link in the video description. With the shunt mounted, it's now time to move on to mounting the bus bar. I'm just going to go right beside it. With the bus bar now mounted, I am going to hold off on making the last cable for the negative side of the system, and I'm going to skip over to making the cables for the positive. If you remember in the last episode, I talked about wanting to keep all of the heavy gauge cables the same length. And so far, that has been the case. All of these cables were factory supplied, and these ones I've made the same. You may also remember that in the design that I did, I didn't actually have the final placement of the shunt. And that means when it comes to running the positive cables from the power post to the breaker and up to the positive, I don't have my final lengths already determined. But that's okay because I'm going to show you a trick that you can use to make sure that all your wires come out the same length even if you don't have the ability to draw things up in CAD first. I'm using a scrap piece of smaller gauge wire to trace the path that the larger gauge wire will take. This wire is somewhat stiff so I can form a nice radius to simulate what the heavy cable will do. Once I like the way that it looks, I put a mark on the wire and then continue from this mark to measure the next section. Doing it this way, I can measure it the whole path as one wire, so I end up with the total run length. The best part is, this in no way uses up the wire, so I still have it for when I need it later. With the first length marked out in full, I know this is about 3 feet of wire. Now I can check and see using the same end mark if I can get from this terminal to the breaker to the bus bar, and from this terminal to the breaker to the bus bar, using the same amount of wire. Now there's three possible outcomes here. One, it's exactly the same, which is perfect. Two, it's too short, and three, it's too long. If it's too short, I can lengthen all three of the cables. If it's too long, I can play with the routing or change the radius where it goes around the corners. The reality is I know it's going to be pretty close, so I'm confident that I won't have to do very much to make all three the same length. Keep in mind that it's the total length that matters, not the individual length. So obviously the distance from this positive post to this breaker here is not going to be the same as from this positive post to this breaker here. However, the total cable length from the positive post to the bus bar will be the same. So using this smaller gauge scrap wire, I've now determined that 36 inches is almost perfect for all three of those runs. Now I can grab my heavy gauge cable and give it a wipe down with this citrus base cleaner to get all the grime off. If you've never used this stuff, get some. Then, after a few snips, I've ended up with three perfectly usable 36 inch long pieces of 2 gauge wire. By the way, if you're wondering where all this beautiful wire came from, this used to be a plow truck, and this was the harness that ran power to the plow. Somehow, with two positives. Oh, you've got to be kidding me! And that's why you don't trust other people to do your wiring. So although it may look like there's a lot of junk in here, a lot of this stuff is quite usable. Now I'm going to start rough running the heavy gauge cable. I know the overall length will be good, so it's just a matter of working out the corners and where it needs to be cut to fit in the breaker. After cutting and crimping, I can do the final fit. For now, the wire is all floating, meaning not attached to the mounting board, but I'll go back after and add some supports. All of these cables that I'm putting on right now are only being put on hand tight. It's really important at the end that you go around and tighten everything according to the manufacturer's torque specs for each component. Also, when installing cables like this one, it is important to pre-bend the cable before you put it on. The reason for this is if you try to bend it after mounting it to the breaker, you can end up putting too much force on the mounting stud and breaking the breaker. Now it's just a matter of repeating the same process for the other two main feeds. And of course, I ran out of red heat shrink, so I can't finish the last cable. But everything is in place, I can tighten everything down, and then there's one more thing that I want to do. Getting the electrical system up and running is something I've wanted to do for a while now. But here's my problem. This is just a battery. I don't have any way of charging it. Now the eventual plan is that up above this main bus bar, we will have a nice big inverter charger. But for now, I've just picked up an inexpensive charger to keep the system going until I get my big inverter charger. 
Now, although it's nice and compact, there's one issue I have with this charger, and that is it doesn't have any way of mounting it. By now, you know my solution is always to design one in SketchUp and then print it in PETG over on my Ender 3 V2 3D printer. Each mount is two pieces that clamp around the charger and fasten together with a small Allen bolt. With the mounting brackets mounted, I now have four holes in the back that I can use to secure it in place. Being able to create and print items like this are what make a 3D printer such a key tool for a build like this truck. I've stopped counting all the unique parts I've been able to create and print. Not only does it fit, it's color coordinated. With all the connections tightened up, there's only a couple more things to do, and the first one, is cross our fingers. Next is plugging in the BMSs. The suspense is killing me. Green light, no smoke, good sign. Green light, no smoke, good sign. Not the easiest place to do this. I didn't plan this part out very well, but I shouldn't have to take these out very often. There we go. Three green lights blinking and no magic smoke. But next I'll turn on the three breakers. Again, no magic smoke. There shouldn't be, there's nowhere for the power to go other than there. And at this point, the three Bluetooth modules that I've taped to the bottom of the BMSs are operational so we can see the information on my phone. We're at about 49% charge. So let's try hooking up the charger. And here's what we get. Battery tight, let's go to lithium iron phosphate. Voltage is set to 12 volts. Current is on auto. Now I can manually select 10 amp, 20 amp, 35 amp. I can go up to 35, but I'm fine leaving it on auto. Now the charger comes with a nice detachable charge cord, but I'm not overly thrilled with the connections on the other end. Now, short term, I will use them, but eventually we'll be hooking up to the main bus bar. For now, we'll do a quick connection here here, and lastly, we'll plug in the lead. The charger now sees the battery voltage at 12.9, and we can hit start and see if we get any magic smoke. I just heard the BMS's click, you can see the amperage climbing up. The voltage climbing up. We now have a 960 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery bank capable of being charged and discharging. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. There's plenty more of this to come. If you've got any questions, throw them in the comment section down below. Don't forget to check out the links. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.